Hello, it's Matt Thomas here from King and Eek, back on Sonic Academy. I'm here today to talk about granular synthesis. Granular. Like, like a breakfast cereal, granular, grainy. Whole wheat synthesis. Good for you, but no fun. Yeah, that's kind of how it is, really. It's quite a lot of trouble, granular, but actually it is really, really good for you. So take the trouble, learn granular with me over the next 15 lessons. And at the end of it, you will have eaten your cereal. Tempted? I'm sure you are. So what is granular synthesis? Well, it's using tiny, tiny snippets of sound to create sort of streams or clouds of textures and tones. It creates sounds that don't really occur otherwise. That's why you've got to take the trouble to learn it. Before we learn all about it, where did it come from? Where did it come from? Where did they find these granular syntheses? They found them in the past, and that's where we're going. Into the past. So first, I want to take things back to the post-war 1940s. Dennis Gable was a theoretical physicist who inspired the Electric Six hit song, Gable. The one that goes, girl, I want to take you to a Gable. I want to take you to a Gable. I want to take you to a Gable, Gable, Gable. Hello? What, it, what, it's not pronounced? Oh. Oh, right. Oh, okay. So first I want to take things back to the post-war 1940s. Dennis Gabble was a theoretical physicist who won the Nobel Prize for, among other things, inventing the hologram. But his work also included research into what he called acoustical quanta, which was the possibility that all sound was composed of a stream of tiny sound particles. Gabor proposed the idea as a mathematical concept and then went on to make some experiments using sound film and a rotating drum cut with many tiny slots. This resulted in a fast series of very short snippets of sound being played back, and by varying the speed of the drum he could vary the pitch. A similar idea was being developed in Germany from the 1940s onwards. A man named Anton Springer was working on his time and pitch regulating machine, and by 1960 it resulted in a tape player called the Tempophon that used multiple heads to play short snippets and allowed for real-time pitch shifting and time stretching, which is insane. This is the same time the Beatles are about to release their debut single, Love Me Do, and there's a machine that can do Ableton-style tempo stretching mechanically. Now, while these ideas were technical steps on the road to granular processing, they weren't actually granular synthesis itself. Getting to grips with that would fall to a Greek composer named Yanis Zanakis. Zanarkis is widely agreed to have written the very first granular synthesis piece, Analogique B, in 1959. Now, Analogique A, written the year before, was your typical modern avant-garde classical style of the time, the sort of thing where it sounds like the string section keeps stopping to play musical chairs while strangling each other with their instruments. However, amongst all this stop-start string playing, the piece is interspersed with strange atonal rapid pulses of electronic sounding bleeping. Now, that was interesting because no one had invented a synthesizer yet. So what Zanarkis had done was this. He got himself a test tone generator from the laboratory that made a sine wave, and he put that down onto tape at various pitches and volumes. And then he got one of these, which is quite a nice little tape cutter. And with this, you lie your tape down there, and you get a razor blade, and depending on whether you want a hard cut or a crossfade, you cut through the appropriate slot. So he cut his tape into lots of tiny pieces in the kind of millisecond range. And then you might imagine that he then sort of jumbled up together at random. No, he had a really, really complex mathematical system worked out which devised what kind of pitch or volume should be placed next to which other pitch and volume. And so he then really painstakingly reassembled all these pieces and taped the tape back together. And that's what created the stuff. Zanarkis continued to explore these tape-based ideas throughout the 60s, and others working in the same genre were also exploring microsound. In 1966, a German composer named Herbert Eimert wrote a piece called Epitaph for Aikichi Kubayama, and that used the tempophon that features numerous granular time-stretched voices. Music concrete pioneer Pierre Schaffer had a very similar machine called the Phonogene. And probably the most famous use of one of these tempophon machines was a brand called Eltro, and this was used by Stanley Kubrick to create the sound of HAL, the computer in 2001, slowly dying. Then, in 1972, an American student named Curtis Rhodes heard Zanarkis give a lecture at Indiana University about his tape granular technique. And Rhodes is so taken by the idea that by 1974 he's trying to recreate it. But instead of using tape, he got himself access to the campus mainframe computer at San Diego University. Not that this makes things much quicker or easier, because this was still the era of punch card programming. 
After some successful tests, he writes the first dedicated granular synthesis software, PLF Clang, in 1975, using it to produce a piece of music called Prototype. Dozens of separate processing stages were required to render the final audio, with a single minute requiring days and the whole piece taking weeks. Now, I don't want to be overly critical, but the end results are not that pleasing. If you can imagine eight minutes of wind noise on an unprotected microphone, livened up with bursts of extreme digital clipping, you'd still have something slightly more lovely than prototype. And to be honest, it seems that Curtis wasn't that impressed either, but he persisted. And by the early 80s, he was experimenting with using granular synthesis methods to replay tiny elements of sampled sounds. Now, Curtis Rhodes wasn't the only musician using computers to realize granular synthesis. Fellow American Paul Lansky followed a parallel path, wrestling with punched cards on an IBM mainframe to produce his own early computer music. If you're a Radiohead fan, you've already heard some of the results, as the band sampled his very first composition for a track on their Kid A album. His interest in granular eventually resulted in producing 1986's rather fantastic Idle Chatter. Similarly, Canadian Barry Truax spent much of the 70s and 80s working on a series of different university computers and developing his Pod and PodX software. These initially used the same PDP computer platform that Peter Zinoviev of EMS fame had used in his early sequencing experiments. While Truax wasn't solely limiting his work to tiny short grain synthesis, his system could produce it, and his interest in the area grew when he perfected his new GSX software in 1985. GSX was the first real-time granular synthesis program, which Truax ran on a DMX1000 digital audio processor. It was controlled via a command line interface rather than having a front end that resembled any kind of musical instrument. In retrospect, Barry Truax has noted, these more cumbersome computer interfaces did result in a particular kind of experimentation and music, and that changed as the software got more user-friendly. So to recap, Gabor conceived of the idea of granular sound, Zanakis realized it with tape splicing, Rhodes and Lansky moved the idea to computers, and finally Truax made it a real-time playable synthesis method. Now at this point, the late 80s and early 90s, the advent of home computers and affordable sound cards saw the pursuit of granular synthesis leaving academia and move into increasingly mainstream electronic music. Curtis Rhodes wrote a number of real-time granular synth software tools for the Apple Mac, some of which, like Emission Control 2, are still available to use for free today. Similarly, Truax's Pod X was recreated for the Mac, and they weren't the only ones to explore desktop granular software at this time. I'd really recommend a visit to granularsynthesis.com, where you'll find links to dozens of the applications and music programming environments that emerged. Some of these, like Max and C-Sound, are still actively being developed today, whereas others, like the Composer's Desktop Project, are legacy software that are now available for free. You may very well be rolling your eyes at the idea of wrestling with ancient 30-year-old software, but many of the world's most famous sound designers still use these kinds of software. You might need an old Mac or PC to run some of them, but you'll certainly find something to work with your hardware. If you're still just thinking, yeah, whatever, Grandad, where's the VST version? There are dozens and dozens of granular synth plugins out there now, some of which we'll be looking at in this course. So interestingly, granular synthesis starts out as software, and only very, very recently do you get granular hardware synthesizers. In fact, none of the big manufacturers have ever actually released a granular synthesis-based machine. So there was quite a gap in the market, and in recent years, that's finally been filled by a number of boutique offerings, everything from Eurorack modular to guitar pedals. Probably the most famous is Mutable Instruments Cloud, which has redefined the sound of ambient modular synthesis. And a new version, Beads, has just been released as I'm recording this. One of the few standalone granular synths ever commercially released is the Tasty Chip GR1, which provides a very visual and hands-on box to engage with. PolyEnd's new Tracker workstation offers a variety of synthesis modes, including granular, but it's not the main focus of the instrument. The absolute Rolls Royce of hands-on granular, though, has to be the Kaleidoscope an enormous two-player touchscreen instrument, which has only ever been made available as a prototype. If you look online, you can find videos of it in action. It's just fantastic. You've got huge interface. It's nothing you can't do in your own software, but the UI, the actual tabletop interface, when you're scanning through the waveforms, you've got a two-foot slider, not some little three-inch fader. Really, it must be a joy to play one. Sadly, I never have. If you are tempted, there is an archive of how to make the case and the software itself is open source, but I've never seen one apart from the original. You'd think someone would have bought it to market, but so far, no. Possibly that's one of the reasons why there's so few dedicated hardware granular synths. It's because we're all carrying touchscreen phones and tablets these days. Really, there's few better ways to interact with granulation than to drag your finger across the waveform you're working with. My personal favourite is an app called Tardigrain, but there are many more out there. <laughs>
So if you've got a phone, tablet, anything, get on the App Store, stick in Granular, see what comes up. There you go, that's the history, that's how we got here. Now we're going to look at what we can do with Granular. Right then, first things first. There's a small matter of terminology, specifically Granular versus Granulation. This is a bit technical, so I'm going to play some soothing images while I discuss it. Many of the earliest forms of granular synthesis only allowed you to select the waveform of each grain from your classic synthesizer shapes like sine, sawtooth, triangle, and so on. However, when the digitizing of sounds, or, or sampling, as we call it here on Earth, became achievable on the same high-end digital audio stuff that granular synthesis ran on, a new variation came, and it's called granulation. So granulation kept all the basics of granular but instead of playing a cloud of sine waves, like for example, each grain could play back a small fraction of the sampled sound, and that's granulation. Now, I mention this because the two terms have pretty much blended together in the years since. So when we're talking about granular synthesis now, we almost always mean some form of granulation. In fact, it's now vanishingly rare to find a granular synth that just uses basic waveforms. So granular, granulation, for our purposes, we're going to use the two terms interchangeably. So the fundamental concept of granular synthesis is to build up a tone from tiny short snippets of sound, and these snippets are called grains. So what can we do with an individual grain? Well, in essence, it's really quite simple. First, there's length. Now that can be anything from a millisecond to several seconds. Traditionally, people like to go with a limit of a couple of hundred milliseconds, and that's why it was called granular little grains. Once you get to a few seconds, it's kind of a big chunk, but these days you'll find most synths will let you run quite lengthy grains. Right, then there's pitch and speed, and they're independent, unlike when you play a sample back. And there's also the direction that the grain moves through the sampled sound, so it can be forward or reversed. And then there's the volume, and that can be static or it can change across the duration of the grain. Now that all sounds rather groovy, but when you pick it apart, really apart from the real time and time stretching, you could do any of that with a, any old 90s sampler, really. So what's the big deal about granular? Well, where granular steps beyond this is in the use of multiple grains at once, you know, dozens or hundreds of them overlapping each other. Depending on the software, each one of those grains can have its own volume, its own pitch, and so on, and they can be drawn from different parts of the sample. Now, once there's several dozen grains firing at once, you get new and complex sounds arising, and that's granular synthesis. Now, that's the core of granular synthesis, but depending on the particular granular synth you're using, all that complexity might then be fed into classic subtractive synth stuff like filters, envelopes, LFOs, and so on. So the granular synthesis engine merely becomes the oscillators in a subtractive synth. Now that approach is very evident in things like Arturia's pigments, Logic's alchemy, and here you can see the granular aspect is presented as an alternative to oscillators or samples. Now other instruments like Sound Guru's The Mangle and the Max for Live instruments, Granulator 2 and Granurize, they're designed with granular synthesis very much at their heart, but they still provide filtering envelopes, etc., to shape the sound further. So, final point before we jump into the nitty gritty of granular unlike subtractive and FM synthesis, there's a lot of variation in terminology and features between the different synths. So, you may not find all the parameters I'm going to discuss are actually in your preferred granular synth. For that reason, I'll keep flitting between a few different ones. Similarly, it's quite hard to break granular down into simple step-by-step -step lessons because so many of these core functions are interrelated, but we're going to try anyway. So stick with me, things will become clear. 
Thanks everyone for watching. We really appreciate all the support from you guys. If you love this video, then smash a like. And if you want to be notified about new videos, hit the subscribe and notification buttons. Peace!